Well, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Yep. A little more excited now that Benny's got the jokes going, right? Everybody good? So, uh, well, my name's Rob Krug. I'm a senior security architect. Uh, now, I've been watching all morning since, uh, since first showing up, and I've realized that I am older than many of you. Uh, I've also been doing this longer than some of you have been alive, so I was actually shedding a small tear in the back of the room earlier. Uh, and hopefully that some of the, the jokes and uh, uh, innuendo that I share with you this morning on hacking does not get lost on the, uh, the age gap. So we'll have a little bit of fun with that. Um, I've been doing this now for almost 30 years uh, professionally. I've actually been getting a paycheck for information security. I will not say the dreaded drinking game word uh, as little as possible. Uh, I've actually, when it's, I actually started before, it was called network security. That's when it was actually cyber. That was a whole movie, you know, the Cybertron. That was like Transformers, right? So that was had nothing to do with the networks or IT or anything like that. That was just the, the cartoon, right? That's all it was for. Never even heard about it until you saw the cartoon. Now, in that 30 years, I've had a lot of fun. I'll give you an idea. I've actually did uh, a lot of what many of you do. So just out of curious, curiosity real quick, how many of you actually do active threat hunting, creating vulnerabilities, metasploit, fun things like that? Few hands. How many of you are in charge of network threat prevention, stopping threats from getting into a network? Very, very good. How many of you are learning how to get into this business? Ah, there we go. That's the audience. Perfect. All right, so I get to help you a little bit with that. I've actually been getting a paycheck for this for 30 years. My first job, I kid you not, I was a hacker for a private investigation firm. My job was to actually break into ISPs, email, and find out when people were cheating on their spouses. That was my job. Now, this is a long, long time ago. This is Prodigy, AOL, CompuServe, a little thing called dial-up, right? It was very easy back then. You just had to type in one or two commands, and you were in. And you'd find out where people were doing the hookups, and the PI would show up and take the picture. That was actually my first job in IT, and that was in 1990. I was getting paid to do that, 1990. So uh, anyone been around doing uh, IT security, won't say the dreaded drinking game where anyone doing it that long? Uh, a couple of hands. All right, so we're the old dogs in the room, uh, and we'll hopefully have a little bit of uh, information to share with you. So these days what I've actually been doing is working as a network security architect. I actually work for an uh, uh, anti-malware vendor. I'll just leave the names out of it this morning. Nice little company, been around since 1988, though. Uh, I actually was previously a director of solution architecture for a firewall manufacturer. So been doing uh, network security, uh, network connectivity, network design, household names for a very, very long time. Part of that was uh, United States Navy. So thank you again to all the vets in the room like myself. I uh, heard someone actually say they were in Navy or was U.S. Navy in the room, walked off, I think. Uh, I was in cryptography in the 90s. Uh, so I was a cryptologist. I was on offense, not on defense. The motto for, uh, the motto for my, uh, my team was in God we trust and all others we monitor. Uh, that's actually a true story. That's actually what we actually did. We looked at everybody else's stuff. And a lot of what I want to share in this presentation is geared towards two audiences. One, the people looking to do threat hunting, looking to get into being a, a, a hacker, getting into doing vulnerability or pen testing, and those that want to secure a network. There's the two little sides that, the white hat and the black hat. Right? And most of you in the room will probably say you're gray hats, but there's usually right and left. Right? There's the good, good guys and the bad guys. And I usually gauge my presentations towards the good guys. I want to stop the threats. Contrary to what Josh said this morning, not to be arguing with, I actually believe it is possible to secure a network. I actually believe it's possible. I've seen it done. I've seen it done. You have to take the users out of it, but that's besides the point, right? <laughs> if you got a user on it, forget about it. It's game over. So uh, when you look at doing this, when you look at doing uh, network security, when you look at doing network architecture, it is possible to achieve security. And that's where I start from. I work with organizations all over the world to help secure their enterprise, whether it be state and local government, school districts, federal government, uh, international organizations. I won't say any of their names because this is being streamed on YouTube, apparently. So uh, security by obscurity is a thing, right? So not saying who they are or what they use or their architecture is very important. I will say that some of the businesses that I've worked with and some of the networks I've worked on have been completely devastated by, uh, by breaches. And then we'll come in and clean it up, fix it, get them back up and running, secure the network, secure the architecture. And it's a huge, huge effort. And that's what cybersecurity, network security is. Oh, I don't want myself a drink now. Uh, that network security becomes. It's diligence. It's practice. It's staying on top of your game. 
And that's something that all of us can do by attending conferences like this, working with the, the, the doing things like picking locks, identifying vulnerabilities, capture the flag, bug hunting, bug bounty programs. These are all very beneficial to network security, to network architecture. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for getting into the industry because we will always be outnumbered by the bad guys. Why? They usually get paid better. Just you know, throw that out there real quick. But I used to, uh, my father who was in law enforcement, once used to wear a shirt and used to say, uh, crime uh, pays if you prevent it. Right? So the difference is the money that we make in this as our careers unfold is money you have to look over your shoulder and say, how do I get that, get that money later? Right? You don't have to be that guy. So with that, so let's get into the presentation. I will try to end on time because I know the only thing standing between you and the food court is me. So I'll go ahead and get into that. Uh, they usually want to start with is explaining what network security is for those in the room. A lot of the vulnerabilities that I'm going to show you today are not fear mongering. I took personal offense when, when uh, Chris Krebs here said that he wants people to stop selling fear. I'm not selling fear. I don't think cybersecurity professionals, network security professionals, network security vendors are selling fear. I think many of them sell awareness. Uh, just because Josh mentioned it a few minutes ago, you have to explain the technology to people that don't understand it. Many of you in the room are experts. You are the Jedi masters of network security, of coding. How many of you have a copy of Kali in your pocket right now? There you go. You're the experts. How many of you walk around with a Raspberry Pi in your pocket running a fake honeypot? Is it just me? I'm just sorry. I'm sorry. It's fun at airports, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, it's we're the experts. We have to explain how these vulnerabilities and how these breaches affect everyday business, everyday networks, everyday users. And that's the fun. It's not fear. It's fun. It's awareness. And that's what we're going to actually do today. So with that, first things first, I'm going to start everybody off, get your security juices flowing. I got a couple breaches here. Now there's a lot of spring chickens in the room. So for those that were not affected by this, don't worry about it. You'll get to play along in a minute. For those that were affected by one of the breaches I'm about to show you, please raise your hand, just like to get a little tally on the audience. The first one, for those in the room that had a top secret clearance, did anyone get exposed by the OPM breach? There we go, a couple of that. all of us, had anyone had a top secret clearance, had all their personal goodies leaked online? Not just our, you know, pedigree information, but the questions they ask. And for anyone who went through one of those interrogations, those questions got you know, a little personal, just, you know, poquito, right, just a little bit. But that's something you want to be, you know, not have out on the dark web. What about the uh, the Yahoo breach? Anyone get affected with that? One of your spams account got uh, compromised, right? Right. No one actually uses that for email, I don't think. In that case, we had almost a billion uh, spam accounts got compromised. Start off with spear phishers. What about the uh, IRS breach? Did that would affect anybody in the room. Anyone get caught up with that? Maybe some of your parents did, right? I know some of the younger folks in the room, right? What about Equifax? Anyone get caught up in that one? There we go. All right. What about Ashley Madison? Did we get caught in that one? <laughs> it's good. Some people do raise their hands. I have had people raise their hands and go, uh-oh, no, no. But if you were one of the 37 million men and one woman caught up in this, you had all of your personal information released online. You're, oh, you, oh my gosh, they're lonely. Let me send them a picture. You made yourself the spear phishing target of the millennia, right? They know you're lonely. They know what you're looking for. They, they, don't, they know more than your spouse knows about you. And they send you a nice little email and says, hi, open this. You click on it, game over. And it happened more and more. What I actually found out that was actually kind of curious, what, besides the 15,000 .mil and .gov email accounts that was caught up in this, uh, but was the actual, the, 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 the after effect, the class action lawsuit, where they paid victims $3,500. All you had to do was admit you had an account and they'd give you $3,500 for your trouble. I don't think anyone collected on that one, just, have, just out of curiosity. So when you start looking at these, these, these attacks, when you look at how they start working, it really becomes fun. And that's what this cyber sec network security becomes. The awareness, the ability to explain this to your friends, to your family, to your colleagues, to your customers, to your bosses, to your fellow employees. Explaining how these attacks work and becoming the master of them is where cyber se network security, I keep saying cyber, sorry. Never, I'm with a lot of drinks tonight, uh, which I'm ex Navy, so that won't be a problem. Uh, but when you, and it's Friday, so you know it works out. In this case, some of these attacks have really, really evolved, and they're going to continue to keep on coming. All you have to do is read the headlines. Getting a breach by just a simple text message, 
and simple SMS messages compromises the phone. Botnets taking over the globe. The Myra botnet's still out there. It's still available, right? It's still just, it's just sleeping. People install plugins with the, uh, the understanding that if you install this plugin, your PC goes faster. People still believe that. I, I watch people do it all the time. Oh, I put a plug in it. It's going to keep me safe. No, no, no. You want to be very aware of what that is. Explaining what these attacks are is something that everyone in this room should strive for. We are the experts. We are the ones that are going to take these messages and educate the rest of the globe. Like, don't install that third-party keyboard. Use the one that came with the phone. It works just fine. Right? You don't need the extra stuff. And there's no such thing as a secure operating system. Every operating system can be compromised. It takes diligence to actually secure them. Whether it be Windows, whether it be Windows uh, 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 Linux, whether it be uh, uh, even Kali, even Unix, Mac, it doesn't matter. All of them can be compromised. I see someone shaking their head. All of them can be compromised. Are you able to type on it? Then you can compromise it. That's all it takes. I'm going to show you some operating systems that have some fun with it shortly. For example, fileless malware. Explain that to somebody. Explain what fileless malware actually is. Can anyone actually do that real quick? Can anyone explain that just visiting a web page can, can compromise your system? Understanding how these attacks, I mean, how have you been to a, a little website called speedtest.net? Just it, three hands, come on. Participation! It's more fun when you participate. In 2013, speedtest.net was compromised with a keylogger. All you have to do is visit the page from January to March. And you had a keylogger installed in your system. Just visiting a page can deliver a fileless malware attack. And explaining that, understanding the network architecture and how you prevent that. How do you stop something like that? It's diligence. It's staying on top of the patches, staying aware of how the different vulnerabilities work, and preparing your systems to prevent it. Now, I, I like to do a lot of demonstrations of how hacking works. And I've got a lot of stories over my 30 years. But one of my favorite topics in, in network security or hacking or pen testing is social engineering. It's my absolute favorite. You know why? Because I get to hack the distance between the keyboard and the chair. And nothing is easier than hacking the human on the network. It's the users that are the number one security vulnerability. This is actually a true story from South Florida. Mike works at Animal Control. Gets a phone call from Joe. Hey, Joe, hey, Mike, I'm, a, I'm an IT contractor. I'm responsible for fixing all the laptops in the county. I see a problem on yours. I'm going to send you a log me in request. OK. Mike clicks on it. Hacker takes apart the network for 45 minutes. The only reason the hack stopped, because Mike was union and closed the laptop to go to lunch. True story. In that case, half a million dollars in damages. Half a million dollars in damages in 45 minutes. How could that have been stopped? Well, maybe having more than one VLAN in the network might have helped. But it, it, doing things like having awareness of who could run log me in, application control, making sure that Mike knew to counter, hey, Mike, unless you get a phone number from IT, a callback from IT, and these, these individuals with these passcodes, with this multi-factor authentication, you hang up the phone. Awareness, training, end-user education. These are how you stop these. Understanding how these attacks work are a lot of fun, too. In fact, I'm, I'm not a Taylor Swift fan, but uh, I was at DEF CON that year. Uh, Taylor Swift, actually, is a more ACDC, you know, a more, I'm a little too old for uh, Taylor here. She said, there's no need to hack a network when you can hack the people that run it. Networks are hard, people are soft. She was very right. I've seen more breaches from an end user than I have from zero-day vulnerabilities in browsers or OSs in hacking an operating system. It's the users that get compromised the most. Just to give you an idea of some of the, some of the vulnerabilities that are out there, or some of the end user traps that have happened, for example. Some of the ones I've, I've seen around there. For example, ever walk into an office and see one of these laying around? End users buy them at a little place called Office Depot, right? The Internet Address Password Logbook. End users love the postings on social media, like Dustin's first credit card. He's growing up so fast. I'm so proud. Look at the very next post. Thanks for dinner, my new car, and everything on eBay. Right? And users do strange things. For example, how many of you have seen that in the office? I walk in the Fortune 5000 business, Fortune 100 businesses. I'll flip over the keyboards. There's the username and password. It's laying right there. Or the smart cards left out. 
I once worked with a federal government agency. I won't say which one. Let's just say, uh, well, maybe they explore space. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, this particular agency uh, still used smart cards. And this is only last year. It was their only form of authentication. Just a smart card. That was all they had. They've been compromised for years in replication. Easy to get around. And they were still using it. And users love to do fun things like check their Twitter password to make sure it's secure. And you're using a password to check it. Happens all the time. My personal favorite one, though. This one was actually a lot of fun. Has your credit card number been stolen on the internet? Enter the number and expiration date to check. And users do fall for these. Making them aware of these vulnerabilities is easy. This was actually caught, taken off the bottom of Angry Birds. The little free ad that comes on the bottom of Angry Birds, right, when you're playing. This was a few years ago. Didn't mean that I, uh, the, the uh, uh, iPad got hacked. Didn't mean Angry Birds got hacked. The ad server got hacked. The third-party ad server that was pulling the ads got compromised. Hacker injected that. How many people do you think fell for that? Enough that you can go buy a stolen credit card online for 10 bucks. How do you buy a stolen credit card online for 10 bucks? You use a stolen credit card. Uh, it's a nice little trick. Uh, <laughs> nice and fun, entertaining for uh, if anyone wants to talk on the break. But in these cases, this is where the end users are the number one vulnerability. But having that awareness, having that training, doing like Josh said this morning and explaining this technology to them, making them aware of that is how you actually stop it. Now, when you start looking at some of these compromises, when you start looking at how easy they are for social engineering, this is another level of example that you can actually help educate the masses. Now, I, I don't personally watch hacker movies. The last hacker movie I saw is Sneakers. I'm not sure if anyone actually saw that one. It's like, there we go. That's the best one ever made. I'm sorry. Dan Aykroyd, his mother, is just awesome. All right. So uh, anyway, in, in, I don't watch Mr. Robot. Actually, you can swear in a stack of Bibles. I've never seen an episode of Mr. Robot. Why? Because I'd be one of you in the audience. I'd be screaming at the screen, you're doing it wrong. That command doesn't work. That's not a valid IP, something like that. So I have no desire to watch Mr. Robot or any other hacking movie. I did have to go see one, though, uh, in 2015, uh, Black Hat. Uh, my wife made me go because Thor's in it. Um, oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was painful. For anyone who didn't see it, don't bother. I just saved you two hours of your life. You're welcome. All right. So, But Thor was in it, and there was one scene in the movie that was really cool. There was one scene that was really cool. He, Thor, <laughs> not the crap. No, Thor gets his girlfriend dressed up in a pretty white dress, go into a bank and say, oh, I spilled coffee on my report. Can you help me out and print out another one? Right? It gives the security guard the thumb drive, the, th the bank teller the thumb drive. Thumb he plugs it into the computer, and Thor steals all the money in the bank. Right? Oh, sorry, spoiler alert, but again, you're welcome. Just, that was the only scene worth seeing, uh, and I saved you about 90 seconds just on that one. So in this particular case, I decided to replicate this in real life. Would that actually work? So... It actually does. So in this case, uh, I replicated it, but I can't pull off Thor, so I'm the girl in a pretty white dress, pair of spy sunglasses, nice little HD camera in the bridge of the nose, and the ever-popular USB stick. Walked into 20 businesses in the Tampa Bay area. Banks, doctor's offices, law firms. One building I walked into, I didn't have an appointment, but the security guard helped me. She printed out the file for me. She took the thumb drive for me, no problem. They took it, no, no issues. All I had to do is say, excuse me, I have a meeting down the hall. Could you print out my, uh, my, uh, my report for me? Or, excuse me, I have a job, I have a job interview next door. I didn't have time to print it. Can you print out my resume? They would take it every time. 20, 20 businesses in an afternoon, I got turned away twice. 18 times someone took that thumb drive. One young lady got the gold star award. She actually asked me in the doctor's office, is it a virus? No, no, of course not. Okay, here you go. That's all I had to say. It's the best AV in the planet, right? I just say, no, I'm not a virus, and it just works. That's, that's talking about sandbox effectiveness right there, right? I am not a virus. Okay, you're allowed in. But think about that. How many of you are aware of a little thing called HIPAA? How many of you realize what the financial penalties are for HIPAA? $15,000 per medical record. Not many doctor's practices can survive that. Maybe the big hospitals and insurance companies can, but your small, a small town practitioner cannot. That's where they're going to get hosed. Having awareness of the, oh, viruses don't tell you they're there. Bad guys sneak in. Having challenge, being uh, authoritative, saying, no, you're not allowed in the building. Having that awareness. Again, security is achievable with diligence 
and rules, training, policies, procedures, and enforcement. It is possible to get there. Another one. Nice little other fun trick with thumb drives. Again, the users are your number one victim. Bought a little couple, bought a couple thumb drives on the on Amazon there. Thirty, you know, thirty thumb drives. Loaded them up with some interesting files. You know, keep it interesting. Checking access, financing accounts, wife pics, XXX pics, right? And if you click on any of these wonderful files, you get a nice little public service announcement. You know, you've been hacked. Just kidding, right? Thanks for playing the, the game. And then drop those thumb drives all over South Florida. I, if, 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 haven't guessed yet. I live in Tampa Bay, so uh, all over Miami, Boca. One got on a plane and flew to D.C., which is kind of interesting. Put them at Starbucks in the restroom, parking lot, business center. Nice and fun, right? Then I pulled the analytics of these little thumb drives. Who picked them up and plugged them in? In case anyone is interested, it's very easy to do. By the way, nice little scripting. Capture their OS, their username, their IP, their location, all that nice little fun stuff. And you get to see that after Five whole days, you had 67 people pick up a thumb drive and plug it into their computer. I dropped 30, 67 times. I take that back, 64. One guy clicked on all four files. Can't fix stupid. Um, but in that case, I guess he thought it'd be different on the next time. Uh, but in this case, yes, 64 people picked up the thumb drive, plugged it into their computer or their network, and I was able to see their data. How do you stop that? Well, you stop USB drives in the building. That's for one. You disable USB ports, you make sure who's allowed to connect devices, who has authority to do it. How does that work for us in the, in the field of educating them, making sure, hey, just because it has a USB port doesn't mean you have to plug something in. Take that curiosity away from it. That's one of the educations that you can do, one of the lessons you can teach other people, make sure they're aware of it. Another one, social media, my favorite fun times. We've been seeing a whole lot of things in the press about hacking the election in 2016, right? I'm not going to get political on anyone, but I made some nice little fake news website just to play along when 2016 to show that a fake news website, oh, and a Twitter bot can be very entertaining, especially when you have a fake news website with, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm going to have to both sides here. If you click on anything or click on that clickbait there, you get the nice little, you've been hacked, just a warning. But how do you make things go viral? How do hackers make things go viral? Well, again, the Twitter bot. That's the, the easiest ways to do it. Doing this live on stage with a fake Twitter bot. I have 241 victims in 20 minutes. More than that in just the first 30 minutes. And then by the end of the day, almost 5,000 victims. That was a fake Twitter bot just sitting out, hey, don't click on this. What do they do? They click on it. Why? It's pretty and blue. I must click on it. That's what the users have been programmed to do. Oh, if it's magical, it's blue, it takes me somewhere special. So they click on it. And I sent one to the Associated Press. Don't click on it. They click on it. Sent one to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 Elections 2016. This is how hackers steal your data. They click on it. Right? It's really that simple. That's how the bad guys do it. They're not hiding. They're in plain sight. And users fall for it. So you have to be aware that users have to be trained. Take the knowledge that you gain from these kinds of conferences. The lessons that you're going to partic participate in over the next uh, couple days. I saw the, the lock picking, the breakout sessions, the capture the flag, the lessons you learn in that. Take that back and educate users, educate your admins, educate your network administrators, your business owners. These are the vulnerabilities that are out there. These are how they work. It helps to prepare against them. It takes diligence and hard work to stop them, but they are stoppable. That's work. It's fun. Phishing attacks, for example, having email security systems in place, being aware of what a phishing attack is. And it's not always just the phishing. It's not just the emails. For example, how many of you won the African lottery? Just out of curiosity, right? Well, what about the Nigerian prince that's owing you money? Anyone got one of those guys chasing after you, right? Did you guys know it was two Nigerians that actually got arrested for that? I would never have called on that one. I thought it was two guys out of South Beach. But uh, it was actually two Nigerians that arrested for that. What about the one that uh, um, uh, uh, Microsoft calling to help you upgrade to Windows 10? Anyone get that one? The IRS is calling because your social security number is invalid? Yeah, that one's a Nice little phishing, right? But the one like my wife got uh, from Apple. I call home. I travel quite extensively. I call home. Hey, honey, how you doing? I can't help now. I'm on the phone with Apple. Why are you on the phone with Apple? They call. There's a problem with my phone. Hang up the damn phone. It's, it's not Apple. Being aware of these things, having this education that, no, Apple does not call you. Microsoft does not call you. Well, sales, maybe. 
And if you're a network admin and you signed up for Office 365, they never stop calling you. Uh, it, it, if you have this awareness, then make sure that it knows that somebody's not going to call you and say, hey, your, your social security number is invalid or there's a warrant out for your arrest. Hang up the phone because they don't call you to tell you the police are on the way. They just show up. They don't usually announce themselves. But understand these phishing attacks, not just what they say in the email, looking what they're doing, looking how they're actually preparing these attacks, how the bad guys go about it. I won't spend too much on this particular one because many of you in the room probably practice this in your free time, but going through and looking for a company on doing research and finding the company contact information, finding the email addresses, all of that stuff is public. That's how they get your email addresses. And then they craft that wonderful little phishing email and they send it in. And the next thing you know, your end users are clicking on it because they get an email from the executive officer, the CEO, and it's got a little, look, a pretty blue link. Oh, it's from the boss. And it's got a pretty blue link. I must click it. And that's exactly what they do. And that leads to ransomware. How many of you have actually seen ransomware in action? How many of you have actually made ransomware? Oh, all right, just a trick question. All right, just saying. Going to say just another spear of phishing on the other end, sorry, that's social engineering. But in that particular case, for those who haven't seen it, just to show you what it would look like in you know, a little thing called Office 365, end users working along, looking in their nice little Express spreadsheet, they get that spear phishing email. This is the typical user in some of those government offices or school districts or otherwise. They see that nice little email from the boss and says, hey, install this application. Oh, it's from the boss. It's pretty. It's blue. I must click it. They click it. They run it. They do what the boss says. Next thing you know, programs start acting funny on their PC. The fan turns on for some reason. The disk starts spinning up. The mouse gets a little lag in it. What's going on? What's happening to the PC? Where are my files? As the end user is going about this, they think everything's just busy. Before they know it, they go look at their files. Watch how quickly the ransomware works for those who haven't seen it before. The files are already getting encrypted. Watch it through the whole directory here in just a matter of seconds. And that is a server ransomware attack. That's how quickly it happens. That's how our end users just click on it. But explaining to those end users in the office, if you get an email from the CEO telling you to click on it, don't! The CEO does not tell people to install software. That's our job. That's the IT folks' job. Having that training, having that awareness in place, understanding where those vulnerabilities come from. Educating the end users is very, very important. That's where it gets to be a lot of fun. That's where IT security becomes fun. You are the translator. You are the Rosetta Stone. You're the, uh, the, the uh, what's it, uh, the other one uh, at the airport. Uh, oh, it is Rosetta Stone. The translating software. You are the, the conversion. You're the translator that says, this is geek, this is English. You're the job that's actually responsible to tell them this. That's the power. That's the authority. That's the fun. That's the wisdom that you bring. That's what makes you the Jedi. These are the droids you're looking for. You want to be able to explain that to them. And these attacks continue. It's really fun with watching the action in the mainstream. I like the, the latest spear phishing attack. If anyone has it, oh, it's advancing. How many of you have actually seen the new one? It's actually called the sextortion email. Anyone seen that one? A couple of celebrities have, let me tell you. One in this year just fell forward alone. I'll show you how it works. They've gathered your data. The bad guys gather your data from some other popular breach. They scan the dark web. They get your email address, a password that you got compromised on one website or another. And then they send you this nice little email that says, I've been hacking you for months. I've seen everything you've done. Oh, yeah, those websites you went to. Haha, <laughs> naughty, naughty, naughty. If you don't pay me Bitcoin, I'm going to tell all your friends and family all the dirty things you do on the Internet. How many of you don't go to bad websites on the internet? <laughs> no, no, no one person raised their hand. All right, perfect. We're all, we're all honest then. Okay, because uh, anyone who did raise their hand, I was going to say you're lying. Uh, in this case, this particular breach, they send it to you. They send the exploit. To, they send you the email, and you fall. People fall for it. You can go on right now and look at that Bitcoin wallet, and it's ticking up. A celebrity earlier this year in January got this email and said, oh, someone stole my pictures and decided to release them on her own and say, oh, well, I'll beat the hacker to it. They won't have power over me. It was a fake. <laughs> you, 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 these are the end users that we must be prepared for, okay? Because they're going to be on our networks. They're going to be on our systems. These are the ones that you have to protect the most because they'll see this and they'll do things like that. How many of you have uh, uh, attended college and gone to some kind of psychology class? 
couple hands. So you recognize this little particular graphic, yes? Maslow's higher needs. All right, so this is about, for those who aren't familiar with it, this is basically uh, a, a, psycho a psychological uh, makeup of the human mind of what it takes for a human to become self-aware, right? How to take care of themselves. And the first level is physiological. This is the ability, you know, warmth, shelter. These are the, the core needs of a human being. Have you guys seen the update? You've seen the update. Perfect. So everyone is new at the new level that came out, right? <laughs> now, for many of you who joined the public Wi-Fi today, um, how many of you did, just out of curiosity? Look at one person. All right, so we're in a very dangerous room right now. Uh, so I was listening to uh, Benny this morning talk about joining the, the Wi-Fi with, uh, with Callie, or if you brought your work laptop and you joined the Capture the Flag network, you're doing it wrong. Uh, yes, that actually does happen. Playing with Wi-Fi and having Wi-Fi awareness, Wi-Fi security is absolutely required. It's the one of the easiest ways to compromise devices. It's one of the easiest ways to discover zero days, attack users, and it's really simple to do. You, all of you can do it. All of you can run fake hotspots, fake networks, turn it up. How many of you have seen the FBI surveillance van, right? Uh, SSID, right? Well, you can name those SSIDs whatever you want. And no, more, no place is more fun on earth than actually going to Starbucks. I'm <laughs> just saying. Uh, actually, how many of you have been in Starbucks and seen all the people there? All the people on their laptops? Have you joined the Wi Fi in a Starbucks? Do your friends join Wi-Fi at Starbucks? Nice little SSID called ATT Wi-Fi, right? Everybody knows it. Everybody's once, once upon a time connected to it. But how many of the end users on that network do you think are up to no good? Have you walked around and seen everybody's device? What everybody's doing on all those shiny gadgets? Did you see this guy sitting in the back of Starbucks? <laughs> Actually wearing a hacker t-shirt. Sitting there in there pretending to be ATT Wi-Fi. That was actually what I was running. What was I doing? Oh, SSL strip, a few other commands, fake websites, nice little thing called a pineapple. I'm sure none of you have one in your back pocket. Or running on a Raspberry Pi, or running it on your phone. It's very simple to do. How many of you have done this kind of a testing before? Perfect. A few hands gone up. And this one, this is the most fun that I have. I've actually got one now. It's a Raspberry Pi with a Verizon Air card on it, multiple hotspots. I can make it look like eight SSIDs as I'm walking around an airport. It's a lot of fun. You'd be surprised how people connect to it and just start surfing the net and you can see everything they do. In this particular case, I was setting up fake, fake banking websites. Wells Fargo, Bank of America. So that when they would connect, they'd get my DNS server, they would go to my website, unencrypted, and I could see their credentials. And just as an education, gentleman logged in, tried to pay his mortgage while he's at Starbucks. These are the end users you have to be aware of. He's trying to pay his mortgage. I stayed up. Who's paying their mortgage at Wells Fargo? <laughs> Sir, I am a hacker. I have stolen your information. <laughs> it gets better. I, I thought it was going to be a fist fight, but it worked out. I explained to him I was deleting the information. He would never want to do that. I was being a public service announcement. Explaining, you want to do that, go home, do it on a secure system, secure Wi-Fi. Gave him my business card, let him know I could help him. All that. Showed him I deleted the laptop right there, an image on a virtual machine. All happy. He bought the coffee and took the picture for me, so it worked out pretty good. Uh, in that case, that's exactly how... We become the experts, the professionals. We become the evangelists. For those that want to get into that line of business, it truly is rewarding when you can start going out and educating people how to not be a victim, how to be protected. Not just the commercials you hear on, on talk radio or on the, on the infomercials in the middle of the night. Install this and it'll protect your PC. Use a VPN wherever you go. Don't join public Wi-Fi. Use a VPN. Oh, yeah, using a VPN, but where are you going? I've had people say, oh, we only use Tor to connect to the Internet. Oh, dear God. <laughs> you, you, understanding that that's not exactly what you want to use to connect to the Internet. That's when you want to break the Internet. Uh, you want to connect to different things. Understanding this, having this information, this is how we become the experts to show them that when they go to a hotel, don't join the hotel Wi-Fi network because it may not be the hotel Wi-Fi. It may be the guy next door, and he's watching everything you click on. And yes, it was fun at the Marriott last night. You, you see what everybody's clicking on in all the rooms in different directions. You'd be surprised what people click on when they think they're alone in their hotel rooms. Or maybe you wouldn't be. Uh, and this, in this case, it's actually fun when you start explaining these, how these vulnerabilities work. Now, traditionally, I would do a demo in this part of the presentation. I would normally have one of my gizmos set up, one of my attacks set up. 
Uh, unfortunately, I said, this may not be the audience to do that because there's too many of the, the hackers in the room. It may backfire. It may not work out. Or people might get offended. I didn't think anyone would be offended if I hacked everybody in the room, would you? No? Yes? Maybe? Some of you? Some of you would say, no, you can't hack me. Okay, so we won't do a live demo today. I do have a recorded demo for you. It's a lot of fun. And I pick on my neighbors. Again, being a technical expert, being a security expert, explaining how vulnerabilities work, more fun on your home neighborhood than it is anywhere else. So I live in Tampa Bay, and I have a neighbor who's a Tampa Bay cop, the detective. I won't uh, tell you his name or anything, but he's really into drones. Anyone else into drones? Anyone? He's always doing, he's, at the, he's always out in his front yard. He's got the little headset on, the little VR headset. He's doing the Stevie Wonder impression, right? He's chasing the neighborhood cats, taking pictures of the neighborhood flying it way up there, buzzing around, doing all kinds of crazy stuff with it, right? And we're good neighbors. We have fun with each other. We mess with each other, throw fireworks at each other, have cervezas, go to the shooting range, fishing, all that kind of stuff, right? So we have a good time. And uh, we mess with each other on occasion, practical jokes, things like that. So he decides to text me one night. He says, hey, why are you up so late? Dude, why are you texting me at 1 o'clock in the morning? I love my new drone. He takes a picture of me through my office window in the back of my house with his drone, he thought this would be funny. It didn't work out well for him. I have to pay him back. Payback is coming. So I think about it for a couple of days. What kind of fun can a quasi-ethical hacker have fun in a residential network? So I decide to send him a text of my own. Hey, bro, remember that, remember that drone pic? Oh, seriously, man, I was just kidding. You got to let that go. <laughs> cool. I see you too. Oh, cool. Did you get a drone? No, bro, I got your TV. Uh, by compromising his Wi-Fi, I took a picture of him from his own television. For the security vulnerability experts in the room, that is uh, actually from a LG smart TV running WebOS. And for the, anyone that's ever looked at it, it takes less than a minute to compromise. I'm just saying, lots of exploits, especially when you leave it in default and you don't ever update it, right? Uh, so in this case, this is blackmail evidence. He's wearing his shoes in the house. His wife has that plush white carpet. He's not allowed to wear his shoes in the house. So he's got his feet up on the ottoman there. He was none too happy the next morning. Um, <laughs> his payback was to, you know those big adhesive parking tickets? Have you guys seen those? They put them on like the driver's side. He put those all over my windshield, like ticket for being an ass. Um, it didn't, that actually backfired further because he had this LG smart TV, but something else he had in his network that I decided to also mess with him uh, was since he likes LG so much, he actually had their smart refrigerator as well. And it was in default mode. Guess what showed up on his ice maker? Uh, the little logo, the little uh, the in-screen display there uh, was not exactly what it was supposed to be. Let's just say it was a picture that gives you a reason to have the munchies. Uh, in that case, uh, that was actually paying him back. But this is the fun that you can have with these connected devices. Understanding these vulnerabilities, where to go, how to find them. You know, obviously playing with Metasploit, Kali, all the, all the different patches, all the different security tools out there, they go back. They go back a long way. Collecting them, using them, training on them, those can be a lot of fun. But putting it to practice in the real world, being that quasi-ethical hacker, being that bug, uh, that bug hunter, that threat hunter, has a lot of fun to it. It becomes very educational. It gives you the power, the responsibility, and the, the ability to train others how to not be a victim. And it's really fun to find some of these, too. Some of these will actually pay you. And there's rewards for them and finding other kinds of things and seeing how you can actually protect the different networks. It's a lot of fun. Well, understanding how all these networks communicate is also something. While you're practicing all of your network security, your dark arts, make sure you're focusing on general networking. General network, IP communications is still the fundamental way everything communicates. You've got to understand how that works. So don't leave that out of your education path. Make sure you're mastering that as well. Network security, the connectivity of things is really important. For example, just to explain how that works. How many of you in the past uh, 24 hours have pumped gas? We're going to do a little, little threat testing real quick. Perfect. Okay. What about the handle the doorknob in the, or the, the stall lock in the restroom? You want to do that one? Past 24 hours? Yep. Okay. Uh, what about handle the remote control in a hotel room? Yep. Imagine who else was handling that remote control room the day before you checked in and what they may have been doing with it, right? Understanding how those different services. Now, uh, what about the gym equipment? You know, because not everybody wipes it down unless someone's watching, right? Now, I want everyone to take your finger and put it in your mouth right now. 
No one did it. Look at that. You're learning. Okay, so no one wants to pass the germs along. You want to make sure you're using, you're cleaning, you're disinfecting. You want to make sure these devices, the connectivity, how everything is connected, how things touch, how different exploits work, how these different attack surfaces work so that they actually spread through different networks. Understanding how you can architect that solution to prevent these different attacks. Because everyone wants to make sure that hand going into the cookie jar is secure. It's clean. It's sterilized. Because you don't want that hand touching up against the other cookies. You don't want the, the crumbs from one cookie going to another cookie. You don't want the cookies touching, right? All of that's where the, the germs and viruses all start to spread together. Understanding that connectivity is a lot of fun. Getting into security threat prevention, getting into network security. There is a whole literal guidebooks, a whole archive of information that you can use to secure networks. Understanding security best practices. Understanding how to protect networks and protect users in different networks. Making sure that you're securing all of that critical data. There's NIST. There's the Center for Internet Security. These are the things that you can do that the NIST framework is extremely popular to actually identify the vulnerabilities, the weakness, the precautions that you need to take in a network. Understanding this information will help you architect the solution that you need to actually prevent the breach. Again, it is preventable. Just have to take the users out. If you make sure that you secure it, if you make sure that you set it up in a way where east-west inspection takes place, you're inspecting your encrypted traffic, you do have a sandbox that works, and it's inspecting more than executable files, that it is block until verdict. When you have these different solutions in place, you have containerization, you have the reporting, you can actually secure a network. Now, these guides get very complex, they get very diligent, they get very in the weeds, so I'm going to actually explain it from a little high level. If we want to get past all these red dots, the first thing that we need is the blue dots. We need the firewall. We need endpoint control. These are just some of the things that you need to secure end users, secure networks. Email protection. Not just internal email, not just, but for the webmail as well. So many organizations I've seen compromised because some user went to their, their Yahoo, their Outlook, their Hotmail, their Gmail, or something like that. Not the corporate email. One of, the, one of the breaches I actually did the forensics on was a fortune, I won't say the actual name, they're a very, very large international company. Billions and billions of dollars in revenue every year. Billion, Multi-billion dollar company. Gets an email, CFO gets an email from the CEO. Hey, wire transfer, $100,000 to Beijing. Okay, did it. Next day, they find out it was a breach. Find out it was a hack. Call me in to do the forensics. I'm working with the IT admin. And I look at the logs. I'm looking at it. doesn't make much sense. I'm looking at it. And the email went to the CFO, and it was in his junk folder marked as phishing. He unjunked it and then fell for it anyway. Understanding that maybe he shouldn't have had unjunk authority would have been pretty helpful, right? Architecting these solutions would have prevented a breach, would have prevented those attacks. Multi-factor authentication. If you're not using it, then you're actually going to be compromised. It's not a... It's not a uh, if, and, or else. It's something that's going to actually happen. For example, I love to point this out. How many of you tell people to use multi-factor authentication? There you go. All of your hands should go up. You should be singing this from the hills. And I'm saying multi-factor, not two-factor. How many of you, for example, shop at Amazon? Come on, participation. All right, so you shop at, how many of you use multi-factor when you log into Amazon? Less than half of you who shop at Amazon raised your hands on the second question. What that means is when you go to the checkout and you hit checkout and make my purchase, you actually have to enter a code. It sends you a text message, an email, something like that to validate your identity. Because when was the last time Amazon forgot your credit card number? Never, right? You want to make sure you're actually telling people, tell your friends, tell your family, use multi-factor. It's available on all the things you do, all your e-shopping, your e-commerce, your webmail, your social media. These are one of the things that you can actually advocate, evangelists, even evangelists for, and tell people to use to actually secure and beat these, uh, these breaches. It's really important. This is the skill set that all of us in this room have. We're aware of this. We know how these things work. Make sure you're securing the networks. Make sure the Wi-Fi isn't just left open. Make sure it's VLAN off. Maybe you wouldn't want your guest Wi-Fi, for example, to be on the same VLAN as your servers, right? Just like a school in South Florida. They learned that one the hard way. Making sure that you don't have your, 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 your uh, point of sale machines, like an airport and maybe certain East Coast city, did not have the, their uh, POS terminals and their uh, air, uh, air reservation systems on the same Wi-Fi network VLAN as their guest Wi-Fi. 
for an airport, an international airport. Network architecture, understanding how everything communicates, understanding how the, understanding how the vulnerabilities work is paramount to cybersecurity, to network security, being a security professional. It's something that all of you have. You have this knowledge, you're learning it, you're seeking it out, share it with others. The more we can stop and educate against the, these attacks from happening, the more we can actually protect users, protect data. Data archiving, data encryption, making sure people have backups. What is the most important data in your home? Anyone share that one? Anyone know it real quick? How many of you are married? How many of you have families? Perfect. What's the most important data in your home? There you go. Someone said the family pictures. The family pictures. What happens if all your digital photos instantly go bye-bye? Right? How much pain does that bring? Right? Many of you have identity protection. Many of you have backups of credit monitoring service, things like that. Okay, you're protected. Maybe you may have data backup for your for your, uh, your My Documents or something like that, or your, your tax folder. But how many of you have a, a cold storage, offline, air gap network backup for your family photos? There we go. Beautiful. You're doing it right. But share that with others. Your friends, your family, your grandmother who just figured out what a digital camera is, making sure that those photos are being put somewhere in a fire safety uh, uh, safe in the house or a safe deposit box once a couple times a year. These are the lessons that you, as a security professional, need to share with others. King goes on, privilege management. Contrary to belief, you do not need to be admin in order for Windows to work. Right? You do not need to log in as administrator for Windows to work. I know, it's, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> you do not need to be root to make things work. Right? Just saying. Just want to make sure you understand the difference here. Many, many of you are already paranoid. I know I was talking to Benny earlier this morning. Uh, absolute paranoia when it comes to logging in, making sure that you log out as the, your user ID to do an install, install the program, log back in as your own user. These are things that you can do. But educate people. Tell people. You don't have to, oh, you have a Windows PC at home? Eh. You don't have to be the admin. Making sure they understand this, setting it up correctly. Making sure they know that you don't have to do these things. Making sure they're secure. Making sure they do have things like monitoring and reporting. How many of you work for a uh, small, medium business or enterprise? Corporate networks. Are you in corporate network security? There we go. Few. How many of you review the network logs? My favorite question of all time. Hey, we got to buy more internet because the internet's slow. Why? What happened? What changed? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's not enough. Why? Who's doing what? If you can't answer that question, you're not reviewing it. Is it a botnet or is it just YouTube? Is it Netflix or is it Tor? Right? Understanding the difference of what applications, having the logging and reporting is, a, is a, a fundamental need for network security. If you're not reviewing the logging, it's going to be something that you're not going to be able to tell what happened. You can't do forensics without the logging. How many of you do uh, network security forensics? How important are the logging? How important is syslog to that operation? It's, there you go. It's, 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 it's the life's blood. You can't even start without it. And then management and training. Again, this is something you're, you're partaking in this now. It's something that you are doing right now to better yourselves, to get down this road. Share it with others. Make sure that they're aware. Understand how these different things happen, how they can protect themselves. And we'll actually be able to prevent breaches. There was an, an article just an hour ago, just this morning, where hospitals have done a study and found that people are dying from heart attack-related incidents due to ransomware attacks at hospitals. That was posted this morning. Share that. Why is ransomware a problem at hospitals? Because users like pretty blue things. They click on it. Understand how that can be stopped. Understand how that can be patched. Understand how that can be prevented. And you'll be able to prevent a breach and maybe save a life. So with that, in closing, just so everybody remembers to leverage a true security solution. I want to make sure you do. You want to keep viruses out of the network, right? You got to keep them off the computer. You want to install real security, right? You want to make it hard to get in. You want to make sure you're installing your security solution in the right place. Never install a security solution for your security solution. It doesn't work out well. Right? Make sure you're doing the training. Make sure you educate the user so that when it says, keep the door locked, they don't leave it wide open. Make sure they're using complex passwords, multi-factor authentication. We don't want to make it too easy. Uh, just so you know, this is actually off a, uh, a very critical infrastructure. I'm going to say what? and the Florida Keys. This is on the, the actual access panel to access the facility. 
for a critic what would be defined by DHS by Homeland Security as critical infrastructure. Just saying. These are the things that we, as network security, as a threat prevention, threat hunters, security professionals, can educate the masses on. With the right security, with the right education, with the right training thing in place, you can actually develop a security solution like this. Nothing got through it, right? How did that, how'd that break? Anyone? I'm sure all of you saw the movie. How many? How did it break? An end user insider threat, and for that we have Chuck Norris. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Any questions, comments, concerns, snide remarks? There you go. Yes, sir. Yes. There's always that trade-off. So, so, to different levels depends. So, his question was, how do I explain? I'm, when I'm out here doing this evangelist, uh, I, I love to do it. This is my passion. Uh, when I'm out there doing it, how do I tell users to get over the cost? Uh, as Josh pointed out this morning, cyber uh, network security can be quite expensive. There's also, uh, to this gentleman's point, his question was, how do you explain the inconvenience for users? Oh my God, I gotta type in a password and look at a message and log in. I can't just click on it and it be there? No. Understanding what the risk is. So for, it depends on the audience. If I'm speaking to residential users, it's the family photos. That's the critical, you start out there, what's mo what it matters most. To the business owners, it's what's at risk. Yes, Equifax, they suffer a massive breach pay a fine, and their stock went down for a day. Their stock took a dip. Their stock is valued more now than it was before the breach. You know that? Same thing with Marriott. Same thing with British Airways. Same thing with Air Canada. They can survive the breach. They pay the fine. They keep on trucking. If they have, or flying in their case, you look at others, if you look at the small and medium business, maybe the, the, the local uh, boutique that sells widgets, they have customer data. They get compromised. They have to pay a fine to PCI. They have to pay a fine to Visa and MasterCard for not doing best practice security. Or the doctor has to has a HIPAA fine because someone in his office clicked on ransomware. Yes, if a doctor's office gets ransomware, that's a breach. Health and Human Services will find them eventually after the lawyers get done. That's an expense. It is more easy to do security the right way, have the training, Make sure people aren't logging in as administrator. Having an AV software. Using multi-factor authentication. It is easier to do that than to pay for the breach, than to clean it up after. Because a doc that small, the medium business, they won't survive that seven-figure fine. How many of you know about GDPR? A couple hands. It is insanely powerful. Regardless if it's applicable, it's insanely powerful and it affects businesses here in the States. If you do business, if you have a customer or you have do work with any citizen of the EU, you are under GDPR regulations. You are, can be subject to its applications, to its fines, and they're not small. You can be tied up in years of litigation and still have to pay the lawyers in that case. It's always easier to set it up correctly in the first place than it is to clean up the breach after the fact. Yes, is it an inconvenience? Yes, does my wife hate typing in my passwords? Yes, does she hate when she logs into American Express and it wants to send me a message to make sure it's okay? Yes, does she despise the hell of that? Absolutely. When was I last hacked? Never. When was the last time she had a virus? 20 years. How long have we been married? 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> understanding how that works, understanding the risk factors involved. When was the last time my grandmother lost all of her family photos? Never. Understanding that, understanding of the risk, understanding the precautions is important. And yes, there is always a trade-off. There always will be. There will always be the users, especially in the, the younger generation today. Sorry to pick on the, the any uh, millennials in the room. Oh, it's my app and I my data and I want it now. No. You have to be prepared to protect it. What is it worth? Understanding that it's always going to be a trade-off. But yes, it is explainable. Great question. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? All right, I will not hold you up from lunch any further. Benny, back to you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so we decided to cancel lunch. So we're going to uh, 